Bingo! Here it is. It's uh, 12 o'clock rock on a given Monday with uh, Marco Mina, who is not here, and me on a Monday talking about energy on a Monday. Welcome back to the show, Marco. You rock, my friend. I can't <laughs> think of a better place than time to spend with you and the two of us and Mina, if she's able to join us, than every other Monday and talk about the rock and rolling world of Hawaii energy. You bet. That's what we do. And we can rumble and ramble around and find material that lasts and lasts and lasts. There's always something new. Let me just say that the Clean Energy Day program on, um, what, August 16th last week was very good. And we had a lot of speakers, and they were, for the most part, they were candid. Um, and they, you know, they, I think for a, lot, a lot of them told it like it is. And that was good. Uh, David Ige spoke. Uh, Randall Iwase spoke. Um, a lot of people in the energy community spoke, and I think, um, and of course the utility was there and spoke. Uh, and Sharon Moriwaki and uh, uh, Mike Hamnett gave awards, six awards out for transformational achievement, and it was uh, one of those coming together kinds of conferences. So uh, I think that, that adds value, and it probably, at least my observation, it's the best energy conference, at least, that goes on in Honolulu. Um, and uh, we ought to keep doing it on a regular basis, and you should come, Marco, next time. You should I'll get you involved, all right? Well, thank you, Jeff. And I have a, a deep and profound philosophical existential question for you, which is, what is the meaning of is, as far as you discussed uh, what is going on energy-wise? I mean, what is the definition of is in that sense? Can well, there were, I'll answer that by telling you there were, you know, paddle, panels on uh, how things are moving. And um, I think everyone agrees that uh, the next era deal, you know, sucked the oxygen out for a while. Um, uh, that now we're faced with uh, putting more technology on the grid. And Hawaiian Electric said they had a bunch of new boxes they were testing. I, I, hope, it, I hope the tests are short and they get out there in the field. That's going to take some cash money. Um, there was a lot of talk about storage. You had a panel on storage, um, and that was very interesting because not everybody agreed that batteries were the solution. Batteries have their limitations. Of course, Stan Arsman was uh, talking about hydrogen as a transportable storage uh, device. Um, and of course, there was a lot of discussion about exactly what the technology is in batteries. And P.S. Uh, there were a number of articles here in the last couple of days on the MIT uh, Technology Energy Review uh, about uh, the new batteries and the taste for batteries and so forth, um, which, which I would like to use as a, as a starting off point for a discussion of electric vehicles. Um, and finally, we had a, um, a panel on transportation where um, the State Department of Transportation told us about all the things they were doing off the highways uh, to be efficient and clean energy, but there's not too much happening on the highways um, or with fuel or cars, and that's really a problem. Um, and finally, we had a wrap-up panel uh, where uh, Rick Rochelot was very interesting. He's a, my favorite energy scientist for sure. Uh, him and uh, we had Mark Lick there and uh, Kyle uh, Data of Uluponu, uh, all, all very candid. Uh, uh, and I think what, what uh, Kyle said, which uh, was the closing remark of the thing, which I would leave you with, Marco, is he said, um, you know, we haven't talked about um, the limitations on the technology. In this discussion, we, we have assumed that the technology will take us wherever we want to go. So now it's a question of getting our act together and using the technology, of getting on board with it. And I think he's right, and that distinguishes this panel this program from other programs in the past where we wondered about whether the technology would take us there. I think we all agree it's available, it's out there, it's just a matter of getting our act together. And um, I think one interesting thing, let me add this one point that came up in the colloquy, that is we have, you know, a few simple things and they present as a kind of, uh, at least a, a pro forma solution. Number one, we have solar, we have an interest in solar. We have political acceptance of solar, and that's good. Um, two is um, people are not jumping off the grid. They're staying on the grid. One speaker you know, talked about how he got off the grid, and then he regretted that. That was very interesting. A guy who writes for Civil Beat, a fellow named Evslin, E-V-S-L-I-N. Um, 
And, um, uh, you know, bottom line there is that uh, we, we, we have uh, interest in storage. We have a certain technology in storage. Um, and I think we have really all the elements, uh, and we, have, we know what a smart grid is like. So if we put all that together and make it better and better, um, we'll have what we want. We'll get there. Um, because you could, you could generate an awful lot of electricity with the solar panels. You could store a lot of electricity with the batteries. You could handle the peak hours with the batteries. And if you put enough money into it, I'm talking about billions, um, you'll be able to replace the whole system with uh, solar, both uh, residential and, um, you know, um, scaled up, a utility scale. Um, smart grid for, you know, demand response. Um, and, you know, these batteries, we could do it. We have it all there. It's all there. It's just a matter of making our minds up. So that's my takeaway from the program. Well, thank you. And I would appreciate it, uh, hopefully in this conversation, if you would uh, share a little bit more about why this individual who went off grid uh, decided that uh, wasn't such a good move. But let me, I'd like to respond to a couple of things that you said, which is uh, I've taken what I consider to be quite a deep dive into residential energy storage, residential battery storage over the past several months. And I can tell you, Jay, that there is a substantial, a substantial with a capital S, if not the whole thing um, capitalized. There's a substantial disconnect between what one hears at conferences, what, re what one reads in MIT journals and, and other parts of the popular press, and what is available here and now at what price here in Hawaii for residential energy storage. And the, the reality is, and I tried to make this, piece, this uh, point in my piece in the Star Advertiser last, uh, last Wednesday, the reality is that the actual choices to homeowners today, I'm not talking about when the gigawatt factory in the Nevada desert is completed and turning out product or other future dates, but today and in the weeks to come, the choices to the homeowner for residential storage are limited and they're very expensive uh, as a way of comparing, let's say, a battery-less system, no batteries, to a battery-based system for uh, no export uh, uh, connection to the grid where no surplus power essentially or little to no surplus power is permitted to be fed back into the grid. If you take a five kilowatt system, uh, just to make the math really easy, and you're installing it at four bucks a watt, four dollars a watt with no batteries that comes out to twenty thousand dollars if you're putting in adequate storage for such a size system given the usage pattern that we have here in the state which is less power consumed during daylight hours from eight to five more power consumed between five to ten p.m. Uh, you more or less double the cost from twenty thousand dollars to forty thousand dollars and that is uh, going to be a huge hit on those consumers those homeowners who have yet to go solar who may still want to go solar so, again, the, the disconnect being that the, the options and the technologies and the hoopla and the spin and the buzz and, and all the, the wonderful uh, hype words and phrases that people like to use in the energy business uh, just is disconnected from the practicality and the affordability and the availability of the options available right here and now. And that's uh, of great concern to me. I, I, I agree with phone. you, and it should be of concern to you know, the large number of people who cannot afford $40,000. But it isn't a surprise. It isn't a surprise that uh, batteries are going to cost about as much as the panels, and that doubles the price. Um, for those people who can afford that, uh, and by the way, many more of them could afford that if the, the state renewed the uh, solar tax credit, which I think the state should do to encourage, the, you know, the, the progress in this area. Uh, with that and the, uh, the utility doing it on the other side with uh, solar farms um, and, uh, you know, large-scale facilities and community solar also and put, and, I, and I'm not hesitating here, put billions of dollars into batteries. Uh, it doesn't have to be all in one day, but over time and then retire the power plants. Um, we'll, we'll have a system that works. It'll be all renewable. Um, you know, and, and yes, it will cost money. It will cost money on both sides of that equation, but there's no surprise. You know, retiring the power plants costs money. Putting in high tech, putting in new infrastructure, uh, making the whole thing independent of fossil fuels was never going to be cheap. And I don't know where people got the idea that this was going to be cheap 
to adopt new technology around the state to transform the system. Uh, I think we should all be very realistic about this and understand it now, even if we didn't understand it before, that it's going to cost a lot of money. So I don't think anybody's fooling themselves about that. I think it will cost money. And the people who think, oh, it's going to get cheaper and cheaper, no, it's not. Not in the short term, not in the intermediate term. It's going to cost billions to do this. And we've got to do it, no question. We've got Madeline coming down on us. It's been raised uh, to a, a class three storm. Um, it could put the lights out. And the guys with uh, solar, the guys who are, if not off-grid, and there aren't many of those, but uh, independent of the utility for electricity, at least during the day and maybe even during the night, those guys are going to be in much better shape than the rest of us. We've got to be resilient. We've got to do that. You know, climate change is going to give us Madeline after Madeline. And we've got to have this ability. It doesn't matter what it costs. Oh, well, it doesn't matter what it costs. I mean, uh, that's uh, you, you're talking like the federal government, like you spend a heck of a lot more money than you're actually taking in. I mean, I think it matters tremendously what it costs, and it matters tremendously who's going to pay for the cost, and, and under what terms, and over what uh, what length of time. And I mean, we are going in the right direction. Uh, I'll just put another plug in for my friends at KIUC. I mean, they're moving forward with their third third utility scale PV project that will have uh, dispatchable power, battery power. Yeah, I mean 15 megawatts. I was very, I'm always impressed with uh, Dave Bissell. I'm always impressed with him. He talked about that project. And uh, one thing he said, you know, he took his cell phone out in the middle of his remarks and he said, hey, I got uh, lithium ion in my cell phone here. But I know that in a year from now, my lithium ion is going to be about half as good as it is today. I know that if I buy even the best batteries made today, um, they're going to lose their, you know, they're going to lose their ability to hold a charge uh, in a year or two, and they won't be as good. So I have to know that going in. I cannot make any false assumptions about what batteries can do for us or about how long they will last. He's right. And he, he and KIUC go into that whole program, uh, which I agree with you, is very successful, and they are really smart guys. and. They have great relationships, really unbalanced with their community. Um, they, but they know going in that there are issues they're going to have to. And that, that sense of reality, of uh, being realistic about things, very important uh, to dealing with their customer base. And, I mean, for what it's worth, I mean, the company that they are dealing with for their third project is Solar City. Solar City, which loses more money quarter after quarter, year after year, and has never made a penny of profit ever since they became Solar City years and years ago. So, I mean, there's this odd, odd uh, disconnect in a sense that we have some of the more innovative companies, uh, solar companies out there, that are pushing the frontier, the boundaries of the frontier in terms of storage and in terms of innovative means of finance for solar systems, both residential and commercial. And yet, uh, they have been notoriously unprofitable uh, forever. The forever being ever since they have incorporated and started doing business. So, I mean, it's how much longer, how good a business model, how reliable, how solvent a business model is it when we've got these monster solar companies from Sun Edison, which declared bankruptcy back in April, to companies uh, such as Solar City and other major financial uh, development companies, solar development companies, which uh, have never been, never ever been profitable. So, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to diss Solar City too much here because I take my hat off to them in terms of what they are doing, what they've done on Kia for on the island of Kauai. But this is all coming at a tremendous cost in terms of losing uh, their their quarter uh, Q2 losses uh, was uh, whereas over 250 million with an M, 250 million dollars just in one month, uh, one quarter. So. Yeah. Well, limiting it to Hawaii for a moment, one of the things that came up at the conference I thought was really interesting is that if you have this RFP process and the utility is out there, you know, looking to essentially buy renewables from developers, um, the developers make bids. They all make bids. And uh, one of the factors they put in their bids uh, is, a, is a factor that covers the risk. What risk are we talking about? Aside from the ordinary business risks, the risk of doing doing energy development here in Hawaii Nei is the risk of, of permitting. And also, I guess, the risk of uh, that the utility will cancel your deal for some reason. Um, and so you have bureaucracy and uncertainty all around. And any self-respecting, you know, uh, energy developer is going to build 
the risk of, of those uncertainties into his price. The result, of course, is his price is higher. And if his price is higher, our price is higher. If there weren't so many risks, if this was all sort of settled down and the, the developer would know, you know pretty much what was going to happen and, and could be confident about the permitting and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the solidarity of his contract, he would bid less. And if he bids less, our price is less. So um, I don't know if it works that way on the mainland, but I think here, one of the reasons we're paying so much for renewables is because of these bureaucratic uncertainties. We have them in all areas. That's why housing is so expensive, too. You don't know when you're going to get your permit, if you ever get your permit. You may have to, you know, one uh, Castle and Cook project it took 40 years to build the project out in Mililani because, it, you know, they had to go through all these, uh, you know, uh, these, all these gauntlets. And the result, of course, was the housing was far more expensive than it might have been. And I think the same, the same rule applies to energy, and that's too bad. If we address that on a governmental level, we could fix it, or at least in part, we could fix it. Don't you think, Marco? Well, I think you're absolutely right, and I'm just kind of hark back to, I don't have the latest reports from Moody's, Fitch, and S&P, San and Poor's right in front of me, but my recollection is whenever these radi rating agencies uh, most recently do seem to uh, come up with analyses as far as the, uh, the energy situation here in the regulatory environment, that um, one or more of them has been noting the uncertainty in the regulatory environment, uh, which uh, has, like you we're talking about uh, uh, notes the risk involved in terms of doing business out here and and i mean next year i certainly learned the hard way after being invested here for gosh you know more than two years and uh, we know how that turned out so there, there's a tremendous amount of risk and i, I get it i mean you want to factor that in in terms of coming up with pricing but just to kind of round out just to go back briefly to uh, to residential storage my rough estimate jay is that the the cost of Residential storage needs to come down somewhere in the 70 to 80 percent range, 70 to 80 percent compared, compared to what we're seeing now, people like me are seeing now, as far as what providers are offering for storage right now. It needs to come down by, you know, three quarters or so in order to really hit more of the mainstream. I, I believe, I really believe that will happen over time, but it's not going to be on a month to month or month over month basis. It's going to be more incremental, and I can only hope that there will still be enough enough of a PV industry here in the state of Hawaii to be able to, uh, to, to, to stick around long enough so that when those prices do come down, as they ultimately will by that kind of margin, which I very much hope they do, that we'll still be around to... to, to yeah, that's so true. That. I, I saw that in your article. I certainly agree that whatever is happening, it's, uh, it's deteriorating the PV install, install industry, and that, that will have an effect going forward because they won't be around anymore. But uh, speaking of which, we're not going to be around for one minute. We're going to take a minute off, Marco. Marco and me can take a minute off. We'll be right back. You'll see. Aloha. I'm Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider, a weekly Thursday show at 3 o'clock that goes all summer long talking about issues living in a condo association. Each week we bring experts to talk about the rights and obligations of owners and boards of directors to successfully run their condominium. It's a great educational show, answers a lot of questions. We hope you'll visit us sometime. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Chantal Seville, the host of the Savvy Chick Show, which you can watch every Wednesday at 11 a.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. On the Savvy Chick Show, we are all about inspiring and empowering women and girls to be the best they can be by having amazing guests from all around the world. So we hope you'll join us every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Aloha. Mm. Bingo, we're back. Marco and me uh, on Monday talking about energy. Uh, that's energy with an IE, right, Marco? Um, so, so we're going we're gonna to talk now about uh, the, the end of that case. Um, and I, I guess the question is whether it's really the end of that case. So me and Marita you know, brought an action to, I guess, uh, for a declaratory judgment or to set aside uh, the appointment of Tom Gorak and uh, the circuit court judge who heard that uh, didn't take him very long. I, I thought he might wait, like until you know December or January, and that would have made it moot uh, because the Senate by then would have had a, you know an, an opportunity to um, confirm. But uh, no, the, the judge decided within a couple of days um, that that uh, the governor could make an interim appointment, 
and uh, it did not require anything special because there was some reference to that in the Constitution. And uh, it, it leaves me wondering about what the word qualified really means in the statute. You know, it's supposed to be, uh, you know, you can't seat anybody on, until his, uh, rather, he doesn't, that Mike Champley would not leave until his successor was both nominated or appointed um, and qualified, quote. Qualified is an unusual word. It's not the same word as consented to by the Senate. Uh, and I, I think, the, um, I think the, uh, the government took the position that the word meant qualified meant that he had the qualifications. But I, I, can't, I can't buy that because um, that means the same fellow who appoints uh, the member of the commission also determines his qualifications. You still need a third party to determine qualifications. And presumably that would be the Senate. Nevertheless, uh, the decision was to confirm Tom Gorak as an interim appointee with the full authority of a commissioner. What do you think, Marco? Well, uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty darn quick. It was, Jay. I mean, Thursday, Mina had her proverbial day in court, and Friday, the judge issued his ruling. Uh, certainly didn't waste any time. Uh, the two-part ruling that, as I understood it, was one is that uh, I think he, he ruled against her, her standing to sue, uh, that she did not have standing to sue. And second, uh, substantively, he ruled uh, that the governor was, in fact, within his prerogatives as chief executive of the state of Hawaii to be able to do what he did. So Mina's uh, choice at this point is to, uh, to decide that she's played it as far as she wants to yeah, or to appeal. And uh, I believe that, that the uh, appeal would be not to the intermediate court, uh, but directly to the Hawaii Supreme Court. And then, of course, if she were to do that, it would be up to the Supreme Court whether to even hear it. Or, and if they did, then they would have, uh, then they would rule on it. Uh, so it's too bad we couldn't get Mina to join us today because she'd be in a better position to address this. But uh, that uh, sounds to me that's the decision before her at this time. Yeah, I mean, the understanding thing really sort of gets in the way because, um, well, I, I have two reactions to that. One is the Supreme Court, if it ever got this case, um, you know, could deny it on standing and without even getting to the merits or deciding any law. And the other reaction I have is that, well, if Mina Morita doesn't have standing, and I don't think she has any special standing, you know, different than you or me, it doesn't matter that she was former chair of the PUC, that doesn't mean anything, um, not in the context of standing. But, but then who, who would raise this? Suppose there was a good and wonderful argument in favor of striking the appointment. Um, who would raise this? Who would, you and me couldn't do it under this ruling. Uh, who could do it? I gotta believe that if 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 Mike Champley, the fellow who uh, lost his job, uh, uh, not because he wanted to lose his job, but because his term expired, I think uh, Mike would have would have had standing, uh, would have standing both past and present to challenge it if he so chose, but. Uh, as far as I know, he's he's made no move to do so. But I mean, it seems to me that he would, or at least should, have standing if he chose to do so. What about consumer protector? What about a government agency? What about the? Not that this would happen, but uh, you know the um, energy office in DBED. I mean, see, the problem is that they're all part of government, and government is respond. Government is the one who did this. Government is the one who made the appointment. Um, so it's unlikely that a government agency would go against its own appointment. Uh, so if, if an individual citizen doesn't have standing, uh, and Tom, um, uh, rather Mike Champley doesn't want to come around and, you know, take a position on it, take that position on it, there's really nobody, practically speaking, who could. Well, it. conceivably, Jay, think that out for a moment. Conceivably, perhaps the Senate could have sued if they'd wanted to, but interestingly, they chose not to, and instead, filed an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, in support of Mina's position. I actually read that yeah. over the weekend. Yeah. Uh, the Senate majority, that is, the Senate majority being uh, uh, the Democrats, number one, and number two being led by Senate President Ron Kochi from Kauai. So uh, the Senate majority attorneys filed an amicus brief in support of Mina's position. Uh, so I guess I'm thinking, just kind of out loud here, not being a lawyer, that if, if the Senate instead of Mina had chosen to sue, that perhaps they would have had standing to sue because they could have argued that, that the governor was stepping on their, their toes, their powers in terms of uh, qualifying 
a, a nominee for uh, for the commission. I don't know that much about um, you know balance of powers. Certainly, there's a balance of powers question here. It's constitutional in the sense that one one part of government may be violating the powers of another part of government. But I'll tell you one thing: I've never heard of a legislature or uh, uh, one chamber in a legislature uh, suing a, a government body. That that'd be the first time, at least in Hawaii, that I've heard about that. So. Well, I think on the, on the national level, I believe that there have been lawsuits by either the, uh, the, the majority in the U.S. House of Representatives or the majority in the, uh, the, the U.S. Senate. I mean, I'm not a, not a legislative historian, but I, I believe it's not uh, completely out of the realm of uh, one branch of government, either the executive or the, uh, or the legislative branch, suing the other. Yeah. I, okay, sorry, I'm not an expert in that. But let me, uh, let me add that they'll have their voice. They'll have their voice because uh, soon enough, maybe, what, 90 days, 120 days from now, uh, there will be a bill to uh, obtain consent of the Senate, the very same uh, consent. And if they don't like Tom Gorak, then they won't, they won't uh, uh, approve him at that time. Um, and it's hard to stop that if that's what they want to do. Although on a substantive basis, I'm not, I'm not sure there's a lot of good reasons aside from the appointment process itself, uh, to uh, deny consent for him to sit as commissioner. And I think I read something, this has gone but just back to yesterday, seemingly a long time ago, uh, read something yesterday regarding this, these proceedings that Gorak would conceivably be the sitting commissioner, the interim commissioner, through the whole session, which uh, ends, doesn't end until the first week or so of May. So I'm not sure how, how that works. That's I saw that, too. I think that's the law in the Constitution. Uh, they, get, they get to consent. Uh, the person appointed, and I don't know if this applies to the PUC, but in general, uh, gets to sit until the end of the, the session. If he's not affirmatively confirmed by the end of the session, then his uh, nomination is okay. not valid. Anyway, okay. we're, we're about done, uh, but I do want to make one comment before we close about the article you sent me uh, over electric vehicles, uh, standing for the proposition that things are going to happen faster than you think, that the technology is moving so quickly, uh, and people in general would like to see uh, electric vehicles, you know, uh, avoid range anxiety. And of course, there's the, the wild card is the automatic vehicle, which, by the way, started operating in Singapore this week. How do you like that? They're ahead of us. Um, but all this technology moving so quickly that I think that we may, be, we may be on a roll here. We may find electric vehicles are coming around the corner at a high speed. And uh, we may find that the next time people buy them, there'll be more uh, uh, charging stations, more of them. There'll be 200 mile range, which is pretty good, like a tank of gas. Um, and we will we'll be going somewhere. It's happening. I think it's, it's actually, in a funny way, it's reached critical mass. It's no longer an infinitesimal percentage it's an infinitesimal, infinitesimal percentage with large prospect for growing. What do you think? I think the magic numbers are 300 in terms of uh, a standard range, which Tesla can hit is, uh, if you're willing to spend over 100000 That 30000 or less in terms of sticker price. And third, which was something you haven't mentioned, uh, it'd really be great if we had a company that was selling these vehicles that was profitable. <laughs> that we could have some some confidence uh, uh, was going to be around for the duration, uh, duration being at least more than a year or two or three. I mean, uh, so uh, I, I think, you know, it's exciting. Uh, and once we start seeing vehicles that can have that kind of range and, and do have that kind of price tag, I think uh, that it's going to be a very big deal. But, I mean, we're not, we're not there yet. And... Uh, and I keep on going back to, again, being the, the owner of a small business that can't afford to be uh, uh, making, uh, can't afford to be losing money uh, year after year, that uh, it would, it, it's going to be very important to me that vehicles uh, or manufacturers uh, are going to be able to be sustainable over time and make a reasonable profit. I agree. They'll have to make a reasonable profit. And it may not be an American company. It may not be Tesla. Maybe somebody else who can do it cheap. Tesla says they can make a, uh, a car with 200 miles plus for $35,000. That's what they're onto now. Um, but I suggest to you, Marco, that maybe we'll have that plus an automatic car 
uh, which will really, uh, you know, develop interest among the, among the driving community. Um, and I think that will catch on. I actually think if you marry the two elements together, electric and automatic together, it would be irresistible, assuming the regulators allow it to happen like it's happening in Singapore. And furthermore, let me suggest that if it doesn't happen by a company in the U.S., a U.S. manufacturer, there'll be somebody in China who does this. They're probably working on it just as hard or harder than we are, and they can put it together. And presto, they'll be all around the world before we get out, to, you know, out of the starting gate. So we really have to push on it. Not only uh, you know, the people who care about renewable energy, not only uh, the public, but also the energy, uh, rather the automobile manufacturers in the U.S., including Tesla and the investing market. How about that? Well, one of the major players in China, Jay, is BYD in terms of vehicles and EVs. And I know that they, they're, they're, they're big in China. They don't have anything close to the Tesla range. And of course, the Chinese have shown over decades that they can be very, shall we say, imitative imitative uh, in, a, in a, not a pejorative sense, but I mean, they do a very good job of, of copying and doing things that they copy cheaper. And of course, that gets them in all kinds of trouble sometimes in terms of trade wars and so forth and allegations of dumping and, and, uh, and so forth and so on. But I think you're absolutely right that if, uh, if Tesla's not able to, uh, to make a profit, and I really do hope they make a profit sooner rather than later, then there are gonna be others out there who will be able to learn from what Tesla is doing right and what Tesla is perhaps not doing so right and come up with uh, products to be able to make it uh, much more mainstream, make electric vehicles much more mainstream. And I think we make the combination here in Hawaii of more EVs that are powered by renewable energy sources and we're, we're, we're going uh, you know, a ways to hitting that magic 2045 goal of 100% renewable and power generation and hopefully offsetting a lot of imported fossil fuel for transportation. So amen to that, brother. Yeah, I got one more point. Uh, you know that recently uh, Uber entered in a partnership, uh, rather bought, a, I think, a 40% interest in its competitor in China, a competitor that does, uh, you know, Uber, taxi cab kinds of things. A smart move. Instead of, you know, fighting Mother Nature, they went along with it and now, uh, you know, are in a, in a capital con concentration together with the, the competitor. Uh, and that will, that will rule, rule the day in China on that kind of business. Well, this could happen too. Tesla, you know, creative guy, um, he could get into a joint venture or some kind of partnership with some other company in the world, uh, bail him out of any financial issues, uh, find new technology, new innovation, and maybe the answer ultimately for this marriage of uh, the two technologies uh, will be a, a capital concentration that is a, on global scale. That would do it and that would, you know, create a global market right away. Anyway, Marco, we're out of time. So thank you so much for, for joining me today, as always. I look forward to talking with you in the interim. And two weeks from today, I look forward to having another conversation about all the things that are happening in clean energy here and everywhere else. You are my rock to my role, Jay. 